like my bottle, I don't mind leaving it. I inform the Senate that at 8.30am today, 14 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Urquhart proposing a matter of public importance was chosen. It is shown at item 16 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I call Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And, um, I want to uh, congratulate my colleague here in the Senate, who's doing a sterling job in the seat of the whip, a lot more than is required normally, <laughs> Senator Urquhart. Um, and, uh, she, she's really hit the nail on the head in terms of one of the big concerns at, that people in Australia should be worried about, and that is this Prime Minister's refusal to take responsibility, refusal to be accountable, and displaying day in and day out in front of that microphone that he, uh, that he uh, graces with his presence, uh, more concerned about passing the buck than actually coming clean with the Australian people. And it's that real talk that Senator Urquhart the great, uh, for the great state of Tasmania understands. She talks to her constituents. She understands the pain and suffering that's going on in that community. Uh, happily, they're not sort of locked down in COVID reality like we are in Sydney. But, but this is how people are perceiving this Prime Minister, a man who is incapable of telling the truth, a man who wants to pass the buck, who can't come clean with the Australian people. And We've seen this time after time. The Prime Minister's inability to accept responsibility for any of the failures and policy stuff-ups that have littered his three years in office is now becoming extraordinary. It's a mounting list of permanent denials, failures and uh, self-aggrandisement um, self for his actual version of reality, which just doesn't match with what's happening to people. He was asked about the car park rorts. What did he say? Oh, the minister makes that decision. And when he's asked about the top 20 marginal seats and a list that was in his office, he makes a comment like, oh, I refer to my previous comments. A man who's telling you the truth doesn't go, oh, I'll refer to my previous comments. He actually tells you, no, I didn't see that chart. I didn't see that uh, colour-coded chart of the 20. This Prime Minister cannot tell the truth and is obsessed with covering up his disgraceful tracks that reveal, for those who can see it, because we're up pretty close and personal here in the Labor Party, we can see day after day a constant failure to actually own up to the truth and to govern with integrity. His answer to sports rorts, oh, no, that, that, that didn't happen. And then he takes Bridget McKenzie's scalp, sits her outside for a little while, but he's brought her back into the game. Everybody knows that sports rorts was a rort. Mr Morrison's answer to the alleged rape allegations in the ministerial wing, oh, I've got no idea about that. He's at the microphone spouting off what he wants to say, but the minute he's asked a hard question, this is the man who runs, who runs and hides and has the support of an entire party who continue to accept him as his leader despite these shameful behaviours that we see. He was asked about the bushfires. He was called on to respond for Australians, and what was his response? Mate, mate, as he says, trying to be your friend, mate, I don't hold the hose. There's a lot that mate doesn't hold. He doesn't hold his role in any high esteem. Otherwise, as the Prime Minister of Australia, he would not be running from the truth. He would not be engaged in permanent cover-up. And we see with this Prime Minister a craven refusal to accept even the most minute criticism of his responsibility. It is absolutely shameful, and it harms the spirit of this place. Australia needs a leader with integrity, now more than ever. 
And instead, we have this micro middle manager of MIF, who, who heads out on a Friday afternoon to do a press conference in what's often described by those who have been around this place for a long time, the owl when you take out the trash, hoping that people don't actually notice what's going on. Now, I've already mentioned just a couple of the rorts, the sports rorts, the alleged rape in parliament, there's car park rorts. There's so much more deception. But today, I really want to focus on the robo-debt failure. Now, this is a disgraceful cover-up that continues to this day. Now, robo-debt, everybody knows what it is, but this government and its senior uh, advisers and senior representatives of the department tried to convey that they didn't understand what robo-debt was. Everybody knows what it is. It was where this government ripped off the Australian people, creating invoices that they sent to them that were illegal. That is what happened. It's been a failure from start to finish. They tried to use cover-up words like legally insufficient to cover up the morally unthinkable that a government would serve debts on its own people, debts that were illegal. And they're still continuing to try to hide from the reality of what they did and the cover-up and the stench of what robo-debt was. Now, for people who are listening to this debate across the country, perhaps driving in a car or maybe on a machine, tilling or stuck at home, unable to move around because of the failures of this government to get vaccine in time. I just want you to understand what a public interest immunity claim is. That's when the government says, actually, it's not in the public interest to know what's going on. We need to keep this secret. And one of the things they wanted to keep secret was everything to do with robo-debt. We know from inquiries that they knew that that was illegal at least three years before they pulled up on it. At least three years. And we know that the, the public interest immunity claim was made by the then Minister for Government Services as far back as the 24th of January 2020. So when the government makes this claim, it means we don't have to answer because it's not in your interest to know. They reiterated that claim again on the 29th of July 2020. And the minister sent a letter to the committee saying that the disclosure of legal advice relating to this income compliance program, that's the nice name they have for robo-debt, or a very broad range of matters related to that PII claim, and they, could not, they would not release it. The letters went backwards and forwards to the committee dated the 13th of August in response to Senate orders. So the Senate itself required the same information. That was last year in October 2020. The minister not only decided that they were going to stick with the PII claim, they expanded the claim. Then the minister goes on to assert that disclosing the content to the Australian people, to the Senate, to the committee that is overseeing this matter, disclosing that the content of any legal advice, even the date that that legal advice was given, would have the potential to prejudice the Commonwealth's ability to defend litigation. The Senate's rejected their claims, but this government doesn't care. Mr Morrison doesn't care. He's on for the cover-up every single time, every single day. Cannot come clean with the truth. Cannot tell the truth to the Australian people. Now, they said that they couldn't do anything until the class action was settled. Well, the class action was finally settled, and that means that the government actually, finally, under the jurisdiction of the law in a court, had to admit that they had illegally sent debts to Australian people. The government acted illegally. They settled it. Some people got their money back. But there are lives that have been lost in the middle of this, and they're never coming back. They're never coming back. And all of this terrible action by this government was covered up and continues to be covered up to this day. The committee overseeing RoboDebt has tabled three interim reports on its inquiry. And in two of those reports tabled in February and September, they rejected the claims that the material should be withheld from the Australian people and recommended that the, the Senate itself order this government to bring in the information, to produce the information, either to the Senate or to the committee. The committee's also recommended that the Senate order the minister representing the Minister for Government Services attend the Senate and make an explanation 
of why the government continues to re rely on this public interest immunity claim. It's been rejected by the Senate, and the Senate adopted that rejection recommendation on the 11th of February and the 2nd of, of September 2020. And the minister did come in and provide an explanation of why they thought the cover-up was such a good idea on the 6th of October. But I can tell you today, as of today, this robo-debt black box still continues. The court case is settled. There is no reason for a PII to continue. The government needs to come clean, bring the information to the Senate as requested, stop disregarding the Senate that oversees the government for the people of Australia. This public interest immunity claim is just another tool of cover-up by this government that, as Senator Urquhart so wisely said, is more concerned Senator about passing the buck than coming clean. Your time has expired. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And of course, this uh, motion, this matter of public importance, is, is typical Labor. It's all about playing the man and not the facts. And I just want to touch on uh, Senator O'Neill's comments about the bushfires. I mean, that was one of the most egregious uh, displays of political partisanship I've ever seen. State governments, state governments are responsible Senator for national parks. They're responsible for foreign emergency services. They're responsible for zoning. Okay, a lot of these fires. And can I add? And can I add? In 2009, when 180 people died in Victoria on Black Saturday, you didn't see the federal coalition, who was in opposition at the time, blaming Kevin Rudd for the bushfires. Okay, because it was a state issue that basically all those, all, all the things that deal with bushfires. I mean, obviously these things are going to happen in Australia at the best of times, or well, the worst of times. Uh, when you've got a dry summer, but to make a political partisan point out of this, when the responsibility Order. lied with the state governments and anyone that's from the bush, and, and you know, I do a lot of mountain bike through uh, national parks and hiking and all that sort of stuff, you can see the undergrowth uh, rise. And I know in my home state of Queensland, the Queensland state government's banning beekeepers from keeping their bees in national parks, right? Now, you might go, big deal, what's that got to do with the management of national parks? Because those beekeepers keep the fire trails open. Okay, so there's a lot of issues, and it's well known that the state government's allowing uh, houses and that to be built in flood zones, in fire zones, and it's well known that there's been cuts across all state governments. I'm not picking on sides here uh, in terms of parties. There's been a cut to um, you know, spending on fire and emergency services, especially when you consider the amount of uh, residential development that's going on uh, near state forests, and I happen to live in a part of Brisbane where you know I've got an open block on acreage, but I go and drive back into town, and I think to myself, if a match ever goes off in here, um, some of those houses, I don't know why they're allowed to be there. Um, but the next thing I want—it's funny. The other thing I want to pick up Senator O'Neill on is the public interest uh, point, because that's exactly what the Auditor General said to me last week uh, in, in the replies to questions on notice when I've asked for documentation. Of, of minutes of meetings that the Auditor General had with staff from the Department of Infrastructure over the Leppington Triangle purchase. And funnily enough, he's claimed public interest. He doesn't want to give me the documentation, which is a little bit of the pot calling the kettle black, because at the end of the day, he's criticised the, the, the uh, Morrison government for not keeping documentation, but he himself doesn't want to give the documentation. I mean, isn't audits all about transparency? So why won't the Auditor General come clean on his own record keeping? I've also put that question to him over the car park, so I'm going to look forward to see if he's got any documentation he wants to ha hand over on that, because as a senator you know, who sits in a House of Review, a bureaucrat shouldn't be trying to cover up uh, documentation if it exists. I mean, there's a question whether it exists at all. Um, you know, some people might think that he didn't interview anyone from the Department of Infrastructure before he referred it to the police, given that he didn't really refer uh, to any meetings in his audit report, and nor did he f refer to any meetings with the Australian government solicitor about the due diligence process. Now, given that I've read those papers that got released last week, it was referred to a number of times that there were meetings with the Australian government solicitor. Don't you think the Auditor General wouldn't have spoken with the Australian government solicitor? But it appears that he didn't. You know, so there's a real question of negligence when it comes to this Auditor General. And as someone who's got almost 30 years in finance, let me tell you. The audit work that he's done on the value of the uh, Leppington Triangle was the worst work I've ever seen. You know, Blind Freddy, anyone that knows their accounting standards, AASB 13, paragraph 29 to 31, knows that you have to value land at best use, regardless of intent. And, you've got to and if you take in the valuation standards, 
They say you've got to uh, consider future potential value. I mean, this stuff isn't difficult to understand, but I'll, let, I'll get over onto the issue of day, of course, which is COVID. And of course, uh, you know, we, we hear that you know somehow the Morrison government is passing the buck. Well, nothing could be further from the truth because we've got—I've got in front of me here a national partnership on COVID-19 response that was agreed to at the start of the COVID outbreak. And on page four and paragraphs 20a, uh, financial arrangements, uh, the Commonwealth has agreed to an upfront advance payment of $100 million to the states to be paid on a population share basis. So straight away. The federal government has put in $100 million to state health. And then on top of that, they have agreed for hospital service payments. The Commonwealth will provide a 50 per cent contribution for costs incurred by states through monthly payments for diagnosis and treatment of COVID-19, including suspected cases. Now, given that health isn't the responsibility of the federal government, and we're constantly reminded by Labor that you know, quarantine and vaccination isn't the responsible of state governments, it's amazing how they, the state, states and Labor never want to acknowledge the contribution made by the federal government in helping them deal with COVID. It would be nice to get a little bit of recognition from a change from the, for a change from the Labor Party, rather than playing partisan politics when we should all be working together on this. This is a gross, gross hypocrisy if you compare the, the treatment of the COVID um, uh, pandemic to the treatment of the swine flu pandemic in 2009. Nicola Roxton, the then health minister, was asked, was told basically by the experts to shut the country down. Then she, she ignored that advice. She said, we can't shut the country down. But you didn't see the coalition trying to stir up hysteria and terrify everyone for the sake of making a few political points. Uh, and I'll finish up on uh, overarching arrangements in the COAG agreement of the state public health payments. The Commonwealth will provide a further 50 per cent contribution <coughs> for costs incurred by states through monthly payments for other COVID-19 activity undertaken by state public health systems for management of the outbreak. So the Commonwealth has been making a, a, an enormous contribution to the financial costs of dealing with COVID-19, which is, you know, is, is a state responsibility. And because not only do we have a COVID crisis in this country, we have a health crisis. It's interesting. If you look at the funding that's been given to uh, state governments, the health funding that's been given to state governments, since the uh, coalition came to power in 2013, it has increased from 13 billion to 26 billion. It has increased by 100 per cent in eight years. That is double digit growth year on year. And despite that, the state governments are saying they need more time to get their hospital systems up to speed, etc., etc., etc. Well, you know what? It's interesting. If you go and look at the Australian Institute Health and Welfare figures, the, the decline in the number of beds per thousand people since 1980 has been shocking. In 1980, the number of beds per thousand people was 6.4 beds per thousand people. By 2017-18, which is the last year available at the moment, it is down to 3.6. It is down to 3.6 beds per population. So, in other words, if you assume that the population of Australia has increased a little bit over a double since uh, 1980 and the number of beds is almost halved, it's down by about 43 per cent, state governments have hardly added any beds to the hospital system and the health system uh, since 1980. I mean, this is gross underfunding by state governments. You know, and I'll, I'll point out another thing about Toowoomba and this whole WellCamp uh, issue as well. I, I know Toowoomba quite well, having went to school there and being my hub from Chinchilla. The Toowoomba Base Hospital is in dire need of a $2 billion upgrade. That's why we couldn't put a quarantine centre there, because there wasn't a Tier 1 hospital. Now, the good people at Toowoomba deserve a Tier 1 hospital, mm -hmm. but of course the Queensland State Labor Government, because they've been in power for the best part of 30 years, has failed to put that $2 billion into the upkeep of the Toowoomba General Base Hospital. And it doesn't end there. We've got hospital ramping increasing. Big time. We just read in the Courier Mail last night how a, a, a lady had to wait nine hours for an ambulance. Nine hours. Nine hours. And I can relate to that because when my mum had a stroke in Chinchilla after being a nurse herself for 40 years, it took her 18 hours yeah, to get her to Brisbane, 280 time. kilometres away. And then there's the other issue of the closure of maternity wards. 40 maternity wards have closed in Queensland in the last 30 years under the Labor government. I mean, this is the party that claims to protect women, and yet they're shutting maternity wards in the regions down uh, you know, faster than what the, the funding is. And I mean, a lot of these towns are a lot bigger than they used to be. 
And let's talk about vaccines. Uh, finish off on vaccines. I've got a, an article here. The, the World Health Organisation came out in September last year, and they said that they didn't expect vaccines to be available by mid-2021. They said the phase three of the testing must take longer because we need to see how truly protective the vaccine is, and we need to see how safe it is. So suddenly, once Joe Biden's elected, suddenly the vaccines are available. But the point of the matter is, with Pfizer, it's an mRNA vaccine. It is a new technology. There hasn't been the manufacturing hubs available to export this. And interestingly enough, I've got another article from Reuters here. Pfizer begins exporting US-made COVID vaccine to Mexico. That was 29th of April. In other words, the US didn't even start exporting Pfizer vaccines until late April this year. And somehow those opposite us are running around with you know, allegations made by Norman Swan, unfounded allegations, that somehow we were going to have 40 million available to us at the start of this year. Where do these guys make this stuff up? Senator so if anyone's Rennie, got a yeah, your okay. time has expired. Senator Faruqi is participating remotely. Senator Faruqi, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. What is the one job? that is expected of the Prime Minister of a country. To be a leader, to make decisions for the good of the public and the planet and be accountable for them when it brings glory, but also when they are bad decisions. Mr. Morrison's track record is marred with not just bad decision after bad decision, but like non-stick Teflon, any notion of responsibility just slides off his back. Shirking responsibility has become an art form for the spin over substance prime minister. We are in the seventh week of a COVID lockdown that has brought New South Wales to a standstill on its knees. It is causing havoc on people's lives and livelihoods. Communities are under immense financial and health stress. They are anxious and traumatized at being separated from families due to border closures. All this because the prime minister of this country didn't get his act together on vaccine supply, denied the urgency of vaccination, and kept giving mixed messages to the public, and then couldn't even take responsibility for his botch up and apologize properly. What arrogance. Dodging responsibility, though, is nothing new for Mr. Morrison. Who can for forget his Hawaiian holiday in the middle of the worst climate-induced bushfires we have experienced? And when questioned about it, told us, I don't hold a hose, mate and I don't sit in the control room. Utterly shameful. And what about the sports rot saga, where the prime minister consistently denied having any involvement and kept passing the buck, even after evidence of his office's involvement was revealed? Mr. Morrison has not only refused the calls from tens of thousands for an independent inquiry into the allegations of sexual assault, but has appointed the minister against whom the allegations were and made him leader of the House. Complete and utter bankruptcy. Let's be honest. Senator Scott Morrison Faruqi, is not a leader, nor fit to be Prime Minister. Expired. Senator Green, you are also joining us remotely. Senator Green, you have the call. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. Um, I'm uh, speaking today on this um, NPI, um, really um, taken aback by some of the comments from uh, government ministers uh, and also government um, senators today during this NPI. Um, it is clear that the government wants to do anything other than take responsibility for um, the rorting programs, the, the bad administration, and the real lack of um, uh, responsibility, but also respect for the Australian people and public funding. Uh, they have tried today, as we've seen, personal attacks on the Auditor General itself. Um, uh, we've also seen making false comparisons between election commitments and spending public money. We've seen the Prime Minister and ministers refusing to answer questions about this latest car park rort scandal. We've had ministers running away from press conferences before asking questions. And we've simply had the Prime Minister saying that Australians are the winners of his rorting behaviour. Well, what we know is that this is the latest commuter car park scandal to demonstrate that the government and the Prime Minister really could care less about accountability and responsibility. Uh, we know that the Auditor General's report showed that 87 per cent 
of funded projects uh, went to coalition held or targeted electorates. We know that none of the 47 project sites selected were proposed by the department. We know that a project selection process that included canvassing projects with Liberal, Liberal MPs, duty senators and candidates was the way that the government actually selected these sites. And we know that 10 communi computer, commuter car parks were not even attached to a train station. At least one of the projects was ineligible for funding and only two, only two of the car parks have actually been completed. A $660 million taxpayer funded program to win seats in inner city liberal targeted seats at the last election. That's what we have on our hands. And the Australian public knows this, they understand it, and they are disappointed and they are giving up on this government delivering anything other than slush funds, slogans and excuses. The other thing that strikes me when it comes to this car park scandal, this latest scandal leading on from uh, sports rorts, and I'm sure it won't be the last that we see, um, is the brazenness of the government's uh, delivery of this project. We know that the ANO report into administration of computer car, commuter car park projects um, said that the Prime Minister approved 27 urban car parks in one day. And that was eight days after the commuter car park was established in the budget. So they established the program and then eight days later, the, the Prime Minister himself approves 27 urban projects in one day. Well, that's great for those inner city Liberal seats. But if I compare that to the funding that we are still waiting for in regional Queensland, on the 20th of July, 2019, the same minister, Minister Tudge, who was responsible for the commuter car park program, told people in Townsville that they had secured the Horton Pipeline funding, $195 million. That was 751 days ago. On the 4th of August 2020, the local member told Townsville that the Townsville City de Deal money would be spent on local projects. That was 370 days ago. Now, the Prime Minister was able to deliver these projects and sign off on these projects within eight days of the fund being established. But people in Townsville are still waiting for at least $145 million of that funding to be announced as projects. They still don't know where that funding will go, which projects will get that funding, and not a single dollar of that money has been spent. So when it comes to buying votes in Liberal inner city seats, the Prime Minister is quick to act. But when it comes to delivering on the promises that he has made to people in regional Queensland, people that gave him their votes, well, he's a lot slower to act. This government is being found out as a government that is all about winning votes, delivering announcements, but not actually delivering Senator on accountability. Ryan, your time has expired. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, first, if I can say, would it be possible, would it actually be possible if we can actually put forward or someone could put forward an MPI which isn't saturated in cliches? I mean, there's only 19 words. There's 19 words in this MPI and it's got two cliches. Two cliches in 19 words. I mean, that takes some talent. It's more concerned about passing the buck than coming clean. Is it actually possible to draft something that's clear, simple, direct, good grammar, that people can look at and say, yes, I know what that means? This has all the hallmarks. It's a, it's a, I'll, I'll give you some cliches, Senator Chisholm. It's, it's a dog's breakfast. It's a mare's nest. And I can think of some other cliches which are probably not parliamentary. And then I look at it and think, well, where's the substance? Is it missing something? There's a comma there between accountable and more. It's as if maybe there were meant to be some words there. And maybe those on the other side couldn't decide whether or not they wanted to talk about car parks or whether or not they wanted to talk about robo-debt or whether or not they wanted to talk about the member for Pearce or whether or not they wanted to talk about something else. Because it's, it's, it's all froth. It's all froth, to use another cliche. There's no substance in this thing. Absolutely no substance in it whatsoever. Bereft, bereft of substance. 
And I think if I went down the main street of the area which I'm located in Springfield and asked them, what do you think is a matter of public importance? Can I tell you, I don't think I'd come across anyone who would say that this nonsense is a matter of public interest or public importance. It's quite the contrary. It's the sort of nonsense which gives all of us in this place a bad name, the sort of clichéd nonsense that gives everyone a bad name in, involved in politics. And that is unfortunate. It looks like a group drafting exercise gone wrong. A group drafting exercise gone wrong. I'm not sure if anyone's going to come clean as to who actually drafted this. I'm not sure if anyone's going to come clean with respect to who actually drafted this or whether or not they're going to take responsibility or whether or not they're going to pass the buck. But it's a good example of why Thomas Jefferson, when he drafted the Declaration of Independence, was sitting in a room by himself as opposed to being engaged in a group Senator drafting Chisholm, competition. But then let's go to the substance of the resolution. It was uh, interesting to hear about all the different subjects that have been raised during the course of the debate, none of which appear in the MPI none of which were defined in the MPI. Car park isn't mentioned in the MPI. The Minister for Pearce isn't mentioned in the MPI. The, certainly the pipeline up at Townsville, that's not mentioned in the MPI. All the matters where the debate is traversed in relation to this matter, none of them are actually mentioned in the text of the MPI. But let's go to the, let's go to the substance with respect to what substance there is. And I think my colleague Senator Rennick hit the nail on the head, to use another cliche, and that was this is Labor simply to use another cliche, playing the man, not the ball. Playing the man, not the ball. See how many cliches Senator Scar can get in his speech. You got two cliches in 19 words. Let's see how many I can I can get in my speech in the next six and a half minutes. There's a competition for us. But this is all about the opposition tipping a bucket. Tipping a bucket. There's another cliche. Tipping a bucket in terms of um, in terms of their political discourse, rather than tackling the substance of the of the matter, rather than tackling the substance. It's all froth. It's all froth, Mr. Mr Acting Deputy President, all froth. Let's see. I'll give you a quote, Mr Acting Deputy President. You tell me. You, tell me, you probably can't tell me from the chair, but you might be able to tell me afterwards whether or not this quote, whether or not this quote indicates someone who's not taking responsibility. So I hope Australia is listening. Here is a quote from our Prime Minister, Australia's Prime Minister. Quote, I take responsibility. Ah, I take responsibility for the early setbacks oh, in our vaccination no. program. I also take responsibility for getting them fixed and that we are now matching world's best rates with more than one million doses every week. End quote. I take responsibility. So how do you say? How do you say our Prime Minister doesn't take responsibility? There's a quote. I take responsibility. So how is that someone not taking responsibility? responsibility. I take responsibility. I just don't get it. I don't get it, Mr Acting Deputy President. And in terms of being held accountable, the Prime Minister fronts up every, every day this parliament's in session. He turns up at question time and gets stones thrown at him. Stones, there's another cliche. Stone, maybe it's a metaphor. Stones thrown at him by those opposite. Bricks thrown at him from the sidelines. And he answers. He answers. He provides the answers on the record, record which are broadcast to the Australian people. So how is that someone not being responsible and not being held accountable? I just don't get it. I just don't get it. If you've got a Prime Minister, anyone, who says, I take responsibility, then they've taken responsibility. Hold them accountable, sure, but don't say they haven't taken responsibility when they clearly have taken responsibility, because that's disingenuous and it misrepresents the facts of the matter. And those opposite should deal with the facts of the matter as opposed to dealing with some sort of fictional, fictional um, set of circumstances which just don't apply. Because the Prime Minister has taken responsibility. And he can also take responsibility for the fact that, it, that this country has, based on estimates, projections, saved more than 30,000 lives during this pandemic. He can also take responsibility for the fact that over three million Australians, through JobKeeper, were assisted through the pandemic. He can also take responsibility for the fact that one million Australians are back in work after the JobKeeper uh, program was lifted. He can also take responsibility for the hundreds of millions of dollars of support which the federal government is providing to people in New South Wales, to Queensland, to Victoria, indeed all jurisdictions which are hit, hit by the, the lockdowns which are, are occurring. So 
The Prime Minister does take responsibility. He should take responsibility, and it's important that he does so. But don't act as if our Prime Minister is not taking responsibility when the evidence, the clear evidence, his direct quotes are to the contrary. And let's bear in mind, let's bear in mind that throughout this pandemic, the Prime Minister has taken the best technical and expert advice that's been available. He's taken the best technical and scientific advice that has been available, including, including with respect to the vaccine rollout program. And that's as he should. That's as he should. He he's obtains the advice from the best sources of that advice. He considers it and then he acts upon it. And then you know what, Mr Acting Deputy President? Then things can come. Things can ari arise. Circumstances change, such as the Delta variant such as the Delta variant, and then you have to respond to the changing circumstances. Those opposite don't have to change to the, uh, respond to the changing circumstances. They're always the same. It's always the same. In the two years and one month I've been in this place, it's always the same. The carping negativity, it doesn't change. The circumstances can change. The carping negativity never changes. It never changes. They're just throwing rocks and bricks from the sidelines, and the Australian people see that. The Australian people see that. You could have come into this place with a well-drafted MPI and actually spoken about a matter of substance, a matter that was truly a matter of public concern. A matter that was truly a matter of public concern. But no, no, you've foregone that opportunity, and it's all about base politics. All about base politics saturated in cliches. What a shame. What a great shame. You could have come into this place and talked about the geopolitical situation the world's facing. You could have come into this place and talked about the mental health issues this country's facing and what's the best way for us to do things such as address the youth suicide rate in the Somerset Regional Council. Lowood has one of the highest youth suicide rates in this country. It's an absolute disgrace. How do we address that? How do we address that? How do we get all the agencies working together, the public sector agencies, the not non-government organisations, our whole community mobilised to address those suicide rates in places like Lowood. That's something which is of concern to the Australian public. Infrastructure spending, that's just something of concern to the Australian public. We in Queensland, and Senator Roberts will know, Senator Roberts will know, we're all sitting there waiting for the Queensland government to actually build some effective infrastructure apart from the Cross River Tunnel. Apart from the Cross River Tunnel. All their eggs are in the same basket, the Cross River Tunnel. There's another cliche. About three, four electorates in the whole of Brisbane are going to get trains maybe 10 minutes earlier because of the Cross River Tunnel, Senator Roberts. What about the rest of Queensland? That's a matter of public importance. Why is it that my home state of Queensland has the lowest infrastructure spending of any state in Australia per capita? There's a matter of public importance, Senator Chisholm. There's a matter of public importance. You know why? Because they're broke because they broke. They managed to go through the biggest mining boom the world's ever seen and end up going backwards in terms of debt. It's an absolute disgrace. An absolute disgrace. They've got too many media flunkies, public relations flunkies in the Premier's department and not enough people with picks and shovels actually building things in our home state. Let's talk about the Paradise Dam. That's a matter of public importance. Instead of building a dam, they're actually tearing them down at the Paradise Dam. That's a matter of public importance to the people of Queensland. Any number of matters of public importance, Madam Acting Deputy President, all Order, ignored Senator by Star, Labor. Your time has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Yes, I'm concerned with the Prime Minister's refusal, and I'm even more concerned with our federal parliament's refusal to take responsibility and be accountable. I'm more concerned about federal parliament passing the buck and not coming clean. For almost eight decades, our parliament has been the plaything of three parties, Labor, Liberal and Nationals. COVID exposed for all to see that Australia's manufacturing has been gutted and our independence lost. Despite our mineral and agricultural wealth, we're now dependent on other nations. Subsequent mismanagement of COVID is confirming Parliament's shoddy governance. I'll read a Queensland constituent's comment she directed to our, Labor, our state's Labor government. You told us to stay home for two weeks to flatten the curve. We did as you asked, and 18 months later, we're still locked in our homes. You kept brothels open, yet closed churches. You tell us you're following the science, yet force arbitrary restrictions with zero basis in science. You said, we're all in this together as we lost our jobs and you got pay rises. You made us quarantine in small hotel rooms while making special rules for Hollywood stars. You keep Australian citizens from returning home while allowing Caitlyn Jenner into the country to film Big Brother. You refuse individuals to visit relatives interstate, yet give exemptions to entire football squads. 
You tell us masks are unsafe, then punish people who won't wear masks. You tell us AstraZeneca is unsafe for under 60s, then only unsafe for under 50s. And now you urge us all to get it, sneering at us if we hesitate to follow your ever-changing advice. Your, health, your chief health officer says no one under 40 should be injected with it. You said we can't go overseas, but that you simply must go overseas to pitch the Olympics. You told us that the Black Lives Matter march was safe, yet say a protest for freedom is a super spreader. Is it any wonder millions of people question everything you say and have reached breaking point? Enough is enough. We have one flag, we are one community, we are one nation. To serve our flag, communities and nation, federal parliament needs to change. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, here we have today a um, Prime Minister who won't take responsibility for anything, whether it's bushfires, uh, whether it's sports rorts, whether it's car park uh, rorts, or indeed whether it's the COVID quarantine. Uh, situation or indeed the rollout of the vaccines. He just will not take responsibility for any of those matters which fit fairly and squarely at his feet. We know um, with the uh, car parks rorting that the spreadsheets were in his office on the eve of the election. It was Mr Morrison, our Prime Minister, who signed off on those um, commuter car parks. A fund um, as part of the Urban Congestion Fund, which had $4.8 billion in there to be rorted across uh, a handful of um, Liberal marginal electorates. Now, if that isn't rorting on a grand scale, on an industrial scale, I don't know what is. Seriously. And yet, uh, they try and shift the blame. We had um, the former minister run away from a media questions last week and then not answer them uh, following that by saying he'd already answered them when all we saw was his back as he ran quickly away uh, from the um, media asking the decent questions. We've now got to the point where the Australian public has no confidence at all in what Mr Morrison or indeed his government uh, can deliver or when something's truthful and when it isn't. That's the appalling situation we've got to now because there's so many rorts going on. And if it isn't rorts, it's complete bungling of the vaccine. Uh, it's hardly a rollout. Um, it's so slow. A, a young friend of mine in New South Wales, where apparently we're trying to maximise doses and we're moving them around New South Wales to uh, year 12 students as I speak, was told he couldn't get AstraZeneca until October. He's in a lockdown area and has been in lockdown for weeks. And yet we're told by the health minister, by uh, uh, Senator Colbeck, who reps the health minister in the Senate, that actually there's millions of doses being um, made in Australia each week. Well, why is it? Why is it that my young friend in New South Wales was told? He couldn't get a dose until October, and that's because he sat on the phone for two days, going to doctor surgery after doctor surgery after doctor surgery. Now, thankfully, he's now picked up um, a clinic that's got a few spare doses. But no thanks to Mr. Morrison and his vaccine rollout. No thanks to Mr. Morrison at all. And what did we say uh, today in this place? Labor asks the questions about what is happening in ICU, uh, sadly how many people have lost their lives this year, and we have um, the minister in this place who represents the health minister completely unable to answer those questions. Well, I don't know anyone else who fails to do their job as a long-term union official, in my view, would have got the sack a very long time ago. And yet Mr. Colbeck, uh, Senator Colbeck just keeps surviving. What is going on? The Prime Minister needs to take responsibility for what we saw today from Senator Colbeck. That silence again. How the bloke isn't embarrassed as the clock ticks down and he hasn't got the answers is beyond my comprehension. He's got health in his ministerial I would have thought it would be an honour 
to be a minister in this government and to do your job properly and to have the information at hand. But no, and Mr Morrison refuses to take responsibility for that. Um, but this car park rorts is just now on an industrial scale, like seriously. We've had um, a lot of them apparently uh, ready for approval, and yet only two have been delivered. Only two have been delivered. What a disgrace. Um, but of course, what we know is that the Prime Minister's got form on saying one thing when actually something else is happening. Um, the I don't hold a hose mate during the bushfires when he wasn't even here. And his office completely misrepresented the truth when they refused to say to the Australian public that he was actually in Hawaii on holidays, putting his feet up while Australia burned. Um, we've seen the sports rorts affair, and now we've got the par car park rorts. Both of those, both of those, according to the audit office, landing fairly and squarely at Mr. Morrison's feet, and yet. He still denies any responsibility. Remember when Mr Morrison said all Australians stranded overseas would be home by Christmas? He didn't mean Christmas this year. He meant Christmas last year. And yet we've got thousands of Australians stranded overseas. We've got capacity at Howard Springs. And yet the Prime Minister refuses to take responsibility for quarantine, which is absolutely his responsibility. Remember, who could forget when Mr Morrison stood there and told Australians over and over again, don't you worry, Australia's at the front of the queue when it comes to vaccines. And what did we find? What did we find? We found we were at the absolute end, at the bottom of the queue. Now, how long did Mr Morrison know that before he was forced to actually Tell Australians the truth. How long did he know it? Weeks, months? Did he always know that we were never at the front of the queue? Mr Morrison is never straight with the Australian people, and his inability to take responsibility for these mistakes and mistruths is quite frankly dangerous. It really is dangerous. Uh, but back to the, the car park rorts and the 20 marginal electorates. There it is, another day, another spreadsheet, another minister denying responsibility, and this time it stops right at the feet of the Prime Minister. And no matter how those on the other side try and spin this, it's the ANAO report that makes it very clear uh, that if it wasn't Mr Tudge when he was the minister, it clearly was Mr Morrison. This is not the Labor Party is saying this. This is actually the independent ANAO who is making these statements about where those uh, car park rorts came from. Um, but no, he tries to you know, shift the blame on that or just point blank refuses to answer the question. And what about all of those backflips we've seen? Just Days before New South Wales went into uh, lockdown, Mr Morrison was again out claiming the gold standard in New South Wales, the gold standard, and saying, "Oh, the Premier in New South Wales doesn't rush to lockdown." But of course, when New South Wales went into lockdown, and it's an awful state of affairs, what's happening there? It's really, really shocking. Suddenly, the Prime Minister does a complete backflip. And he's now suddenly in favour of lockdowns. He thinks lockdowns are the best thing. What about when he, when he took the Western Australian government uh, to court, backing in Clive Palmer over millions of Western Australians who were very happy—I was one of them—to have our borders closed? No, no, no. Well, did we get to the truth of that? Finally, it didn't come from uh, Mr Morrison. It came from the Attorney General in Western Australia, John Quigley, who, who belled the cat when he brought out the documents that actually showed it was Mr Porter, the member for Pearce, who um, was absolutely backing in Clive Palmer's um, decision to try and challenge our borders 
uh, taking us to the High Court, wasting West Australian taxpayers' money and time about our borders, which quite clearly are our business. But then suddenly we saw that other pat flip, and I think the Prime Minister kind of went, yeah, well, first I thought that we should challenge the, the borders, and then I changed my mind. Well, he should just get the facts and tell the truth to the Australian people right at the start. Because I tell you what, that certainly damaged Mr Porter, never mind what else has been going on. Uh, backing in Clive Palmer to close our borders has well and truly damaged uh, Mr Porter in the, states, in the federal seat of Pearce. Um, so we just see on and on it goes, and it is time that Mr Morrison, if he can't be honest, he Order, should leave. Senator Lyons, your time has expired. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, wasn't that an, an interesting meander um, that demonstrated remarkably little understanding of the way that our federation works, or indeed the interests that all Australians, including the federal government, might have in provisions such as Section 92 of the Constitution, which provides, among other things, that intercourse between the states should be absolutely free. And for those who um, don't read the Constitution for fun, that means movement. Um, the movement of people around this country, the movement of people and goods should be absolutely free. Um, to suggest that that's something of a um, an indulgence that only a Western Australian might be able to engage in is itself a kind of novel um, interpretation of the way one might think about our nation's founding document. But in any event, there's, there's no reason why our Prime Minister um, should be accused of just about any of the things that have gone in the speeches from those opposite. In fact, I think this is a prime opportunity to spend some time thinking about the achievements of this government in what has been a really difficult time. Because COVID has created some enormous hardships for many Australians. And I, I think of the Queenslanders who have been in lockdown for the last week. and. Um, you know, our family was just one of many who, who went through that experience. Sydney siders and Victorians who um, are in a similar situation. It's an enormous hardship to be locked down, particularly for those uh, who don't get paid on the times when they don't go to work. Um, but the actions of this government have been what has been necessary to keep our economy alive through this time. And so it's opportune to reflect on the way that Australia's health and economic response has quite literally been world leading. We've managed to avoid the kind of COVID-19 death rates that have been seen in the UK and in the USA. Those rates have been, in terms of the numbers of people who have passed away, around 50 times that experienced here in Australia. At the start of the pandemic, the coalition introduced the largest economic support measure in Australian history, JobKeeper, that helped to keep 3.8 million Australians in a job. And that meant our economic performance has vastly been more resilient than any of the other OECD economies that have gone through this experience. And we are, this is quite significant, Madam Acting Deputy President, the first advanced economy to have more people employed in the uh, post-COVID period than there were pre-COVID. Over 74,000 more Australians were in work in March 2021 compared to March 2020. Now, that's um, not to take away from the fact that recent disruptions will no doubt have their impact, but it shows the way that this government has done what's necessary to support Australians through the economic hardship of lockdowns. And we continue to do that because there are a range of new measures in place designed to help get Australians through this period. Our supports have never been set and forget 
in the way that those opposite might think. The new level of the COVID disaster payments and the income support payment recognises the significant impact that the Delta strain has had on communities, businesses and working people. The COVID disaster payments recognise that. And we've already processed more than 1.4 million of those, paying out more than $1.33 billion to working people in New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. There's an income support payment. Um, and all of this is there to help get us through the plan we are implementing to vaccinate all Australians in this country who want a vaccination. We're insistent on this being voluntary. We don't forcibly vaccinate people in this country, but we encourage it and we think it is the responsible thing for people who are in the right health condition to do so. Um, but we're going to encourage people to do that and to do it in the nation's interests. Thank you, Senator Stoker. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I, I'm, I'm going to depart from what I was going to say just to uh, remind the Assistant Attorney that uh, you should not come into this place and cast doubt as to the judgment of the High Court uh, as, uh, was, as, as, as occurred. I'll, I will read to you just so you are fully aware. The Court found on their proper construction section 56 and 67 of the Emergency Management Act uh, 2005 WA in their application to an emergency constituted by the occurrence of a hazard in the nature of a plague or an epidemic comply with the constitutional limitations of section 92 of the Constitution in each of its limbs and I think you should properly uphold the ruling of the High Court as the Assistant Ter Attorney General. Now I will go to the fact that uh, uh, b back on, on task uh, the Prime Minister uh, has been sadly found wanting uh, as a national leader in response to this particular pandemic. Uh, his record of disaster is clear, notably his unforgivable dereliction of duty during the 2019-20 bushfires and now his disastrous failures in the COVID-19 pandemic, especially in regard to international quarantine and vaccination rollout. Now, he did do well in the initial stages of the pandemic because he followed medical advice, but as time went on, he couldn't help but play politics. He fuelled the fires of criticism when the Victorian, against Victoria's tough lockdown last year, whilst disastrously neglecting the establishment of a purpose-built quarantine facility. The Prime Minister saw vaccine procurement and, and distribution as a political opportunity for himself uh, and his government, and in doing, but in doing so he fatally miscalculated the risk management, putting all of, uh, all of his eggs in one AstraZeneca basket. Our nation is now paying a very heavy price for that. At every turn, the Prime Minister has gone to extreme lengths to conceal his government's COVID-19 decision-making, uh, wrapped in cabinet secrecy, commercial and confidence clauses and even national security claims. Now, we've seen the absurdity of national cabinet secrecy demolished last week by the federal court, but the Prime Minister has arrogantly declared he will continue on as before. And that is most uh, inappropriate. He's turned out to be uh, one of the worst Australian prime ministers that we've had. When things go wrong, it is always somebody else's fault. Uh, his avoidance of scru scrutiny is pathological. He never accepts responsibility. He's a dud, he's mean-spirited, blame sh uh, and he bl blame shifts, and he lacks empathy. He's re uh, responsible for much of the economic and social disaster that has befallen much of our country, and I hope the Australian voters recall exactly what's happened throughout his reign. Thank you, Senator Patrick. We have Senator Rice remotely. Thank you. This government and the Prime Minister have got form when it comes to being dodgy. I want to focus on rorts. We've had sports rorts. We've had the female facilities program building swimming pools in North Sydney. We've had the community development grants going to favoured seats. And now we've got pork and ride, car park corruption. I'm hoping that tomorrow the Senate is going to support my motion to set up an inquiry into the Urban Congestion Fund, including the car park rorts because we need to get to the bottom of these murky, rotten, multi-layered rorts. 
mean, the first layer of corruption with pork and ride is that it's very clear from sensible transport planning that building car parks at railway stations is a lousy way of tackling congestion. Good transport planning says that the only way to get to tackle congestion, to get folks off the road, is by improving and expanding public transport services, including improving bus services to stations and improving active transport, improving walking and cycling paths. But then we've got the second layer of corruption, the car park corruption, that goes beyond this cock and bull story that somehow building car parks will solve congestion. There is the fact that having decided to build car parks, that they decide to build them, as the ANAO told us, in 20 marginal electorates. And going to the Prime Minister, what's worse is it's clear this just wasn't a matter of individual ministers thinking up this strategy on their own. This was coordinated, systematic rorting across multiple programs. And given that many of these processes started shortly after the Prime Minister, um, after Scott Morrison became Prime Minister, there is a smoking gun that his office was centrally involved in coordinating the rorts. What it looks like, smells like, is that his government started with a wish list of projects across multiple portfolios and then thought about how to jam them into whatever programs you could force them into. Yet where has Prime Minister Morrison been on these rorts? Nowhere to be seen. But the Australian public aren't fooled. They can see that this is corruption starting at the top. Spending public money on the basis of where projects can win votes rather than on the basis of, the, of need, on proper analysis of where money is best sent and spent. And the excuse that the other side did it too, a childish, they started it, is no excuse. Things have got to change and they have to change starting at the top with the Prime Minister. There needs to be commitment to transparency and accountability. We need to see the colour-coded spreadsheets and there need to be real consequences to this corrupt behaviour. We need a federal ICAC now. It's only by having an anti-corruption watchdog with teeth that this type of behaviour is going to be able to be reined in. Thank you, Senator Rice. The time for the discussion has expired. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents.